I'm going to talk as really I always do about criminalization, carceral consequences, and race at the center of the criminal legal system. Some context, uh, brief context, and one of my favorite Angela Davis quotes, most difficult urgent challenge of today is that of creatively exploring new terrains of justice where the prison no longer serves as our major anchor. And I have a thousand words there on the left and a much more illustrative picture on the right. Um, so let me just say a little bit um, about this slide. You know, I was thinking about it, it's almost been 50 years, you know, we a lot of the conversation about um, the explosion in criminalization and incarceration in the United States. Um, people really trace it back to, you know, our current moment to 1960. Um, and what we've seen, uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore abandonment was well, being illustrated by the picture on the right. We have um, United States, U.S. government, um, U.S. political economy has really systematically divested from all sorts of social goods, um, schools, housing, health, youth, senior libraries, drug treatment, homeless shelters, parks, arts, culture, community service are all shut down, you know, in service of neoliberalism in service of austerity in service of racial capitalism and then what is what is left is the open prison door criminal legal system uh increasingly skeletal activists don't even talk about the criminal justice system because where's the justice um so i'm going to call it the criminal legal system this is a quote from Derica Purnell, and I hope you um, look for her and her work. She has a, a recent, uh, um, really important essay in the Atlantic. Uh, attorney, this abolitionist. Police manage inequality by keeping the dispossessed from the owners, the black from the white, the homeless from the housed, the beggars. Reforms make police polite managers of inequality. Abolition makes police and inequality obsolete. Of course, the road to the prison starts with criminalization. Um, and this is a long, a long story. I mean, the story of the United States is a, a story of a country that's um, founded on uh, um, settler colonialism and slavery. And we see um, that reflected, of course, in the law. Um, someday, I hope you read this book, The Condemnation of Blackness by Kahil Jibrad Mohammed. Um, but certainly, well, there's so much to say, so I'm gonna be brief so we have time for a conversation. Um, but slave codes become black codes, become Jim Crow, um, contemporarily, morph into the war on drugs, the war on dr gangs, the criminalization of poverty. Um, the law sometimes is neutral on the face of it. Certainly that's been the case in the post-civil rights era, um, but the way the law, um, what is criminalized and then who is targeted for enforcement um, almost always has a race and class um, dimension to it. Frederick Douglass, way back in 1883, was talking about imputation of crime to color. Um, more currently, Catherine Russell Brown talks about the criminal black man as some composite stereotype, which um, shapes not only police interaction, um, but interaction of everyday citizens um, um, with black men in the United States. One of the consequences of that um, is really the role of everyday people. 
And I guess this is one point that I really want to stress today. Um, I'm going to talk about the police in, in a minute. And of course, the police officially um, are a major contributor to this problem. Um, but often the police are called. Who calls 911? Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a Twitter person, so um, I know a lot about Amy Cooper and Barbecue Becky and Chad and Karen, um, you know, these um, terms referring to um, white people who deputize themselves in a way and take it upon themselves to call the police, um, um, you know, on, on people of color, particularly African Americans. And so one of the things that I guess I hope all of our white listeners think about or take away from this presentation is, um, um, you know, when do you call 911? When do you need to call 911? What are the potential consequences um, of calling 911? Policing. Policing has a white supremacist capitalist history in the United States. Uh, police emerge out of slave patrols. Um, they emerge in the urban north out of the, you know, the London Bobby tradition and are largely used early on to manage labor dispute and protect property. Um, and some of, you know, some of that property, of course, is whiteness um, as an intangible property. Um, contemporarily, uh, racial profiling, huge literature on this, driving while black, um, you know, that term started to emerge in the literature um, as a result of the war on drugs. And early on, it was about traffic stops. But, um, you know, of course, you know, driving while black, driving while black, standing while black, sleeping while black, um, all the kinds of situations in which African Americans um, are viewed as suspicious by the police. Broken windows policing versus community policing. These are the two major models of policing and uh, both of them are fraught with problems. Um, broken windows policing is the heavy duty public order policing. We've got a crackdown on small crime. That's really exemplified by New York City stop and frisk which was declared unconstitutional um, state of New York uh, 2013. 90% plus of the stops in New York City uh, were of African Americans and Latinos. Um, often conversations about reforming the police suggest that we could use the community policing model. Uh, Minneapolis Police Department, interestingly enough, um, was part of an Obama era program called the Ines National Initiative for Building Community Trust and Justice. And this is the idea that um, police should be in the community more. Um, police should try to um, uh, foster positive interactions and respect from the community. Um, this, of course, involves body cameras lots of implicit bias training, you know, and is often presented as a, as a panacea, a better model of policing. Um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, the Minneapolis Police Department that elected um, Bob Crowell, not once but twice as head of the union, um, you know, the Minneapolis Police Department that killed George Floyd was a police department that had been through um, three, four years of you know, heavily resources sourced training in community policing. Um, one of the consequences, of course, of all of this is racially disparate arrests, despite comparable rates of crime. We see the biggest gaps probably in terms of um, um, drug offenses, where all kinds of data indicates that Black people and white people use um, um, a variety of banned substances at comparable rates, um, but African Americans are 
10 times more likely um, to be arrested, for example, for marijuana. Um, some of you are familiar with Emily Baxter's work and the We Are All Criminals project. And this graphic is from there, right? And so one in four people in the US has a criminal record, four in four have a history. A lot of law, it's break the law, um, but who ends up with a criminal record and race and class play a huge role there. Deadly force. Lots of names here. Um, some of them you know, uh, some of them nationally, some of them locally. I'll just say, you know, in this current moment, um, um, when there's been widespread protests again um, about police violence, um, police violence of black men, um, that this is a long ongoing issue. Uh, some people refer to this as a modern day lynching. Um, we know from um, a variety of data sources, um, not, not official by the way. Let me rewind and say it this way. The, the FBI has never collected official data, police killing of um, citizens. Um, they were supposed to starting in 2015, but really have failed to do it. So the data that we have on um, police killing of civilians is collected by journalists. Some of the early data was collected by the Malcolm X grassroots movement. Um, the Counted is a database that um, the Guardian um, set up. Um, so I guess that says a lot in and of itself in terms of what are the priorities here. Um, but all of those data sources indicate that, you know, approximately 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 people are killed by police each year. Um, African Americans are three, three and a half times more likely to be killed by police than whites. In some states, Minnesota would be one, um, Arizona, um, you know, states with large um, Native American populations, um, American Indians are also disproportionately targeted by police. Um, last thing I'll say about the slide. Um, usually we talk about um, police violence against men, um, and that gets to be the bulk of it, but um, you know, the Say Her Name movement um, wants to draw attention to the number of women um, brutalized and killed by police, and those again are disproportionately black women, um, trans color. Of course, the police are the entryway into the criminal legal system, um, arrest, prosecution, um, pressure to plea bargain, all kinds of other variables are in the mix at the front end. Um, but of course, we end up with an incredible number of people under correctional control in the United States. Um, prison Policy Initiative is a resource that I recommend for um, everyone. They've got a lot of reports and specific areas um, um, of the legal system and all kinds of graphics. Um, will be able to, if you want more about the scope and scale of this. We have 5% of the world's population, but 25% of all prisoners. 2 million people are in prison or jail. That's a tenfold increase since 1970, despite decades of falling crime. So the important thing to think about is that um, more police and more prisons are not really um, a response to crime. Um, they're a response to some other um, economic interests. We think a lot prison and jail and people can find. Um, but we have another 6.7 million people who are under some kind of 
supervision in the community. The bulk of them are on probation, which is an alternative to prison. And as you'll see on the graph, then there's another slice of them that, that are on some kind of conditional release on their way um, out of prison. This is the whole pie of mass incarceration 2020. And it's probably hard to see this slide um, in all its detail. Um, prison policy initiative again. So you can see that the bulk of people who are locked up in the United States are in state prisons. Um, a slice of them are in federal prisons. And that's important to keep in mind when we talk about reforms like um, the First Step Act, which is only targeting um, the federal system, what a, what a small dent that would make. Um, number of people, more than half a million people are detained in jails. And most of them are detained without being convicted. They're, they're sitting in jail, awaiting trial, because they cannot afford bail. And people of color, women um, are disproportionately um, left in this population of people sitting in jail because they can't um, afford to be released. That's, of course, the story of Sandra Bland. And it was almost five years, um, I think just five years the other day since her death in a Texas jail. Here's a quick look at the racial disparities. Um, if everything in life was random, uh, if we accurately took account of relatively comparable participation, we would expect that 64% of people in prison would be white, 13% would be black, well, as you see by the graph, that's not the case. African Americans are approximately 13% of our population um, and represent 40% of those in prison or jail. Here's another way to look at it, race and gender. This is from Sentencing Project and it's based on um, if you were born in 20, uh, 2001, what is the lifetime likelihood that you would end up in prison? Um, men are likely to go to um, prison than women, although the women's prison population in the past 30 years has increased even more rapidly than that of men. Um, then we start to factor in race and, you know, one in 17 for white men, one in three for black men, one in six for Latino men. Um, one of the more shocking comparisons on this chart to me is that black women are almost as likely in their lifetime to go to prison as white men. Going forward, a uh, quote from Ruth and a uh, well-known scholar, well-known um, author of Golden Gula. Abolition isn't just ab abolition, is a fleshy material presence of social love lived differently. Abolition is a theory of change. It's a theory of social life. It's about making things. One of the questions that I hope we continue to wrestle with uh, is the question of can the system be reformed? Certainly part of the uh, series of questions that have come up in Minneapolis and really across the nation, more specifically about the police, uh, can the police be reformed? Um, should the police be abolished? Can we at least defund the police and use the resources we spend on them um, to support 
um, education, to support mental health, to support housing, to to try to support people in that are not carceral. Angela Davis, um, Our Prisons Obsolete is gonna be um, our one read next year. And I'm grateful um, as always to Amy Mars and all our wonderful librarians for organizing one read. Um, you know, and Our Prisons Obsolete, the provocative question. Um, and, and I do hope we continue to grapple with it. Um, what would it mean to say we were abolishing prisons? Um, abolition has become a more, I can't even believe I'm saying mainstream, um, more widely discussed topic. Um, if you read the New York Times, you know, um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore was featured in the, um, in the New York Times Magazine um, um, earlier this spring or late last fall. Um, Miriam Kaba, very abolitionist op-ed a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, about abolishing the police. And so um, the ideas of abolition are old, I guess, you know, rooted really in the in the in the ideas of you know the abolition of slavery i guess as long as people have been captive or in cages there's been abolition move abolition movements um these three bullet points are from instead of prisons a handbook from abolitionists that back to 1976 Things that we won't wake up tomorrow and there'll be no police in prisons. Um, but if we wanted to envision a different world, uh, there's multiple um, steps we could take. Um, moratoriums, there's lots of efforts about don't build, you know, no new jails or prisons. Defund the police is really about that. Can we redistribute some resources? Um, decarceration, how can we support? prisoners, their families, and those in reentry. Um, support always of reforms that mitigate suffering, ending solitary confinement and cash bail. Um, and then finally, exploration. Um, are there abolitionist alternatives to a legal system um, that, that we could you know, be guided by transformative justice rather than retribution? Um, could we divest from the prison industrial complex and reinvest in education, housing, and other institutions that support community? Um, and there's some resources for you. Critical Resistance is a longstanding abolitionist organization founded by Angela Davis, Ruth Wilson, Gilmore, others. Transform Harm is an incredible resource hub um, developed by Marianne Kaba um, and uh, the people with Survived and Punished um, that offers all sorts of resources for um, what would be alternatives to calling the police, how could we support communities, um, you know, what, what does transformative justice look like? And then locally, of course, Reclaim the Block and MPD 150, um, are organizations that are encouraging us locally um, to imagine um, defunding the police and imagining alternatives that support community. All right. I'll leave you with one last slide. This is my favorite of the George Floyd murals down there on East Lake Street. Prison industrial complex. That's a term that uh, people began to use in, well, 70s, but it's really Angela Davis and others that, that flesh out what that term means. And of course, it's an allusion um, back to Eisenhower's conversation about the military industrial complex, um, where you've got 
you've got this collusion um, between government and private interests. Um, and if everybody's making money off a of war, then how could you ever have peace? He's making money off of crime. Um, how, how could you ever not have policing in prison? This is from a piece I did with um, Dr. Rose Brewer a while ago, and so let me just read the essence of it. The industrial complex is a self-perpetuating machine where the vast profits and perceived political benefit lead policies that are additionally designed to ensure an endless supply of clients for the criminal justice system. Okay. Um, how does some profit? Um, a lot of times people complain about private prisons, which are horrible, and those are private companies like CoreCivic or GEO Group that that contract with the government to um, manage uh, manage prisons. Um, private prisons are only eight percent um, of the total population, so they're kind of the tip of the iceberg of the problem. Um, there's a little profit from labor, um, but not as much as we think. Most of the profiting from labor is um, pr prisoners maintaining prison by doing jobs in the prison. Um, increasing profits are about private companies supplying the prison with privatized health care, with food service. Um, no, I'm back again. Uh, services. Um, so there's multiple sources of profit. Um, some of the biggest um, and newer are, you know, JPay. You want to send money to prisoners. You've got to go through JPay, and they're going to take a cut. Um, phone scams, people who are calling out of prison, um, you know, um, you know, those who receive their calls pay exorbitant rates. So the, there's a lot of angles. Certainly there are models of better prison systems. Um, Norway is known for hardly ever sending anyone to prison. Um, the maximum sentence anyone can get in Norway is 20 years, and that's very rare. Um, you know, going to prison is kind of like, um, I don't know, living in a dormitory um, in Norway. Um, and that's very successful for Norway. Um, I think one of the things that, you know, Norway does not have the same history um, as the United States. I mean, there might be some troublesome Viking history we could talk about. Um, Norway is not a country that is based on settler colonialism and chattel slavery and white supremacy and anti-blackness. And Norway, of course, has a very uh, robust um, social welfare state. Um, and one of the reasons that they can have a different kind of prison system is that they have supported people um, in so many ways that really prevents um, a lot of the crime problems we have here. So, so yes, there are better models. Um, I think we need to be careful about imagining that they could just be easily transported here. 